right. Our next speaker, we're going to move from brains to uh, sponsor, sports sponsorships here. Um, Adam Grossman is the CEO and co-founder of Block 6 Analytics. And so help me welcome Adam. Thanks. Hi. Well, usually we have the nerdiest thing about brains, but that was awesome. So that was way better. It was amazing. Um, so uh, I am the CEO and founder of Block 6 Analytics. So Block 6 Analytics is a sports sponsorship uh, technology and analytics firm. Um, we created a uh, software as a service solution uh, that looks at um, various different channels of sports sponsorship and evaluates them for buyers and sellers of sports sponsorship. So think about it. Uh, if you're thinking about uh, in uh, Chicago, where I'm from and where the company is based, if you think about the uh, United Center, we tell both uh, the Chicago Bulls and the Chicago Blackhawks and United how much value they're getting across multiple different channels of sponsorship. Um, that includes in event, that includes uh, traditional media, that includes social media, digital, IP activations. Um, so again, not as cool as what you just saw, but we still think it's pretty interesting. Um, a little bit more about me. Uh, in addition to being the CEO and founder of Block 6 Analytics, uh, I'm a professor at Northwestern's Master's of Sports Administration program, so it's very interesting to see what's going on here at WashU, and we might be stealing some of those ideas for Northwestern. Um, but uh, the classes I teach, I developed two classes uh, really focused on how you communicate data, uh, data and, and analysis to people, particularly who don't have quantitative uh, backgrounds or quantitative experience. Uh, one is called um, uh, Research Methods and Quantitative Analysis, and one is Sports Management Analytics. Uh, I also started a class at Northwestern called Entrepreneurship in Sports. So at, probably won't have time to talk about it during right now, but if you guys are, anybody's interested in entrepreneurship in sports and there's a ton going on in that space, happy to talk to you about that after um, after the presentation or throughout the day. Uh, also a co-author of the book, uh, The Sports Strategist, uh, which was a featured book at the 2015 MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. So if anybody was there, uh, you might have seen that book, uh, or you, you, well, you did get the book, so hopefully some of you may have read it. Um, so what we're really focusing on today, though, and it really builds off actually a lot of what we've been, uh, what, we was just talking, what we were just talking about, is uh, using machine learning in sports. So what is machine learning and what are we talking about? So the main question that we're going to focus on during this presentation is one of our clients for our business is, what, uh, is Pepsi. Um, so Pepsi had just built out a new sign at AT&T Stadium. Uh, a new sign, uh, it was called a, it's a dynamic signage platform. It's television viewable. It's right behind one of the end zones. And what Pepsi wanted to figure out is, can we actually quantify uh, the value of that sponsorship for Pepsi? So in the past, what's been used is actually a much more manual process. Um, what, what had been used in the past is that people, in order to quantify the value, so when you think about signage, there's really two areas that signage generates value. It's one, how many people are actually at the game and see the sign, but the much larger value is usually comes from the television audience, right? Because the television audience is much bigger than what's in the venue. And gaining exposure on television is absolutely critical uh, in terms of, especially for companies like Pepsi, which are looking to reach a massive audience. So in the past, what companies had to do is they had to have people watch the game and time how long it's on screen. And I could see people yawning now. Imagine how boring it is to watch a game and see, oh, okay, there's Pepsi, there's Pepsi, there's Pepsi. So humans, uh, actually, maybe they would be better with the Halo product, but humans are not good at this kind of task. Uh, a repetitive task that often can lead to boredom, causes distraction, causes people to not totally focus. And also there's a, um, uh, a validity issue and an accuracy issue in the fact that you know, different humans are going to say different things. So, you know, I'll, I'll see it on the, on the screen for three seconds where somebody else might see it on the screen for four seconds. And what if, it's, what if the image is blurry? And what if the image isn't in the center of the screen? And what if I miss it? So this, is, again, is not a really good task for humans. And also these logos, I mean, it, most of you guys have watched uh, games on television. You've seen that it's, logos appear very quickly on screen at times. And you don't necessarily consciously, you subconsciously recognize that that logo is on screen, and that's still valuable to a brand, but you wouldn't consciously know that necessarily it was on screen. So what we need to do is find a better way to quantify the value of that sponsorship and of that asset. The other thing that our uh, model in particular looks at is the quality of those sponsorships. So different companies are going to get different values 
from a sponsorship. So Pepsi has a very different business than CDW or another business to visit, or Oracle, for example, where Pepsi is really focused on retail or what's usually called uh, business to consumer clients, where other businesses are focused on or business to business or enterprise clients. So what we want to show is how do we get this? Uh, how do we get this value? The other thing that we want to show is how do we do this quickly, right? In the NFL, there's a game every week. In baseball, there's a game almost every day. In the NBA, there's three or four games per week. We need to get this information quickly and be able to communicate this to partners quickly so that they can see value. And what I think Pepsi in particular wanted to do is that the signage that we looked at was a dynamic sign. So Pepsi could change out the content and want to be able to test different pieces of contents throughout the course of the season to see which was generating the most value. So you know, accuracy, speed, reliability, these are all things that actually machines can be, not always, that can be better at humans at. So that's what we did. So what we wanted to do is essentially teach a computer to see. So that seems like a weird concept at first. Um, it's essentially how do, you, um, uh, how do you teach a computer to have the visual capabilities that a human has? Um, so this is, we use a product uh, based off machine learning, uh, what is called computer vision. It's essentially, we build out what's called a deep convolutional neural network. And you saw some of the ways that uh, brains work in the last presentation, but essentially that the way that the brain works is that neurons uh, build these connections in order to say, you know, when I'm seeing a stimulus or when I'm trying to learn something, I have to build these connections in my brain to say, when I see the Pepsi logo, I know what that Pepsi logo is like. And over the course of repetition, whether you're shooting baskets like Steph Curry or you're looking at a logo, your brain develops these connections. And the way that you develop these connections, the more, the deeper those connections are, the stronger those connections are, the more likely you're able to recall and learn something. So we teach a computer to do the same thing on what's called a, uh, like I said, called a deep convolutional neural network. So I'll spare you the, the gory details on that, but essentially what it does is it breaks an image into layers. Each layer has specific attributes or specific signals that the computer is looking for. So if you think of the Pepsi logo, the Pepsi logo has a certain, certain shape, certain color, certain texture, certain edging, and the computer looks for those uh, you teach the computer to say, this is what the Pepsi logo looks like based on all of those different attributes. And then what, what you tell it to do is then go find, once you see a video, in this case the Cowboys video, you tell the computer to go find that image that has these attributes. So every time you see something in a video, you run it through all of these different layers and say, does it have this color? Does it have this edging? Does it have this text? Does it have all the different features you can look at? Um, so Google, Facebook, Amazon all have versions of machine learning technology. We've specifically applied it to sports for logo identification and object identification. But you can apply this type of image detection technology in other ways. In particular, one of the things that we have are, are looking to expand this out to and other companies have done uh, a little bit already is facial recognition. So you could identify an athlete on the screen anytime you wanted to. And it's the same idea. Actually, athletes are, are potentially a little bit easier than logos because a athletes have um, defined features and unlike logos, they don't necessarily change uh, their shape or color, or they, people don't change as much uh, as they do. So like if you're talking about a human, you'd be looking at certain eye color, certain nasal features, certain uh, ear, ear structure, certain hair way, uh, way that your hair goes. But it's the idea of all you do is you're breaking an image down into components parts, the system looks at it, and it tries to find what's going on. Um, this is how the process works at a, you know, I've talked about it a little bit, but this is really how the process works. We talk about object identification. So, right, if you're talking, telling a system how to find, it has to find a logo, I mean, you can just look at the screen here, right? There's all these different things. There's people, there's stadiums, there's buildings. Um, there's all these different things. So you have to be able to teach a system to classify different types of objects. And that's what we're talking about in terms of the layering approach that machine learning does in this context. So once it identifies the object, then it goes through what's called object classification. So once you get the object, so we say, okay, we've identified, we've identified this is a person. We've identified this is, uh, uh, we've identified this is an image, this is an image, this is an image, this is an image. Here are all the separate images. And then, so that's the identified part. So like, okay, we've identified the arch in the background. Okay, that's an object that we need to identify as something we need to look at. And then our system goes through a classification process, right? So that's where the neural network comes through on the layering approach, right? How do we determine what this is? So if we're talking about the arch, right? The arch has a certain shape, it has a certain color, it has a certain, um, it, it has a certain texture. That's how we classify it to say, okay, we've identified that's an object. Now we classify it as the arch. And then we, term, then we look at value determination. 
And that's where we've created a valuation algorithm that's based on how a company makes money and what a company's brand goals are. Again, different companies are going to have different values and different things that they're looking at. So by looking at that and putting that valuation determination on top of this, and we also look at certain features of the image. But what we want to do, again, at a high level is say we want to identify objects, we want to classify objects, and we want to put on a value calculation based on certain characteristics that do add or subtract value to that calculation. Um, so we'll show you an example of this now, uh, like what we did with Pepsi uh, in this new sign. But here's how it looks like at a, in a static view, right? You can see the system has identified it as an object. It's, identif- it's classified it as the Lipton logo, and then we put a value on that Lipton logo. So we'll show you an example of how that looks now. <laughs> I apologize for the music. We have a Eurocentric team that put that together, so it's a little funky. Uh, but so again, how do we? So we've gone through the first two stages of the process, right? We identified objects, we classified them as either Pepsi, Lipton, Tostitos. Now we want to put a value calculation on this. So the main metrics that we look at, in addition to what we talked about from a business perspective, is this is how we determine value. We look at centricity, prevalence, time on screen, and clarity. So centricity, why do we look at these factors? Because again, the more, the higher or the more, the better you perform, the more likely somebody is going to remember the logo and brand, increasing brand awareness, increasing brand perception is what helps to drive value. So centricity, how close is it to the center of the screen? So if, if we go back, so if we go back to our image, if you think of the television or you think of your computer screen, um, and and you put a hashtag or a tic-tac-toe board on it, your eye naturally goes to the intersections of your tic-tac-toe board, of of the tic-tac-toe board. It actually doesn't go right to the, directly to the center of the screen. So what we look at is how close, we do uh, a nearest neighbor analysis essentially to say how close are you to those images on the screen? Uh, How close are you to those intersections, excuse me, on the screen? And the closer you are to those intersections, the more value that's being created. The next thing we look at is prevalence. How much of the screen does it take up? Obviously, the bigger something is on the screen, the more likely a human is to see it, the more likely a human is to process it as that brand. Um, We also look at time on screen, right? The the longer something's on screen, again, all of those factors play in again. And the last thing we look at from a uh, metrics perspective is clarity. Uh, We have a clarity confidence score that goes from zero to 100, which essentially says how clear is the image on the screen? Right, so if you have to see it, it, the if an image is blurry or you can't see it very, you know, it's flashing on the screen very quickly. Again, you might subconsciously process it, but it's more difficult. It's more mental effort. It's harder for uh, uh, a human's being's neurons to make those mental connections. It is also harder for a machine to make those connections. So from that perspective, these are the four core scores uh, that we look at as kind of the the basic blocking and tackling of how images, uh, uh, how logos on screen are valuable. Then, like I said, we also look at how a company makes money. Um, what we look at it across is really what we have our, our, from a quality perspective is um, how uh, we look at three categories. We look at initiatives, demographics, and channels. Essentially, what is a business trying to accomplish? Uh, who, are the, who is the business trying to target? And what's the most effective way to reach those demographics? In particular, signage is an interesting one because some companies believe that signage, and this is rightfully so, signage is really good at increasing brand awareness among a large audience. Now, there's some brands that's really good for. There's some brands that are not very well known. A lot of you probably have seen the Jersey Patch uh, deals that have gone through the NBA, right? A lot of those companies are not super well-known companies. Goodyear is a notable example with the Cleveland Cavaliers, but if you talk about the Golden State, well, I don't know if we should talk about the Golden State Warriors, but <laughs> they're here, but uh, with Rakuten and um, the Miami Heat, uh, also signed a relatively unknown company, and that's actually a really good strategic decision because that's what these signs are really good at. So if you don't have awareness in a market, you don't have awareness in, in, with a certain demographic, maximizing your exposure through a jersey patch analysis, which reach a, a large audience, is absolutely critical. There are other brands where that's not as important, 
And where we, we scale our value up or down is based on how important that is to a specific brand. We use the same process in demographics and channels. So when we talk about the quantity and quality of impressions or the quantity and quality of exposure, the quantity goes to how many people actually saw it. So if you think of the NFL and the Dallas Cowboys, uh, when the Washington Redskins played the Dallas Cowboys last year in um, the Thanksgiving Day game, it was one of the highest rated regular season games of all time. There was something like 35 million people in the U.S. alone watched the game. So that's a big audience, right? So if you're looking to maximize your exposure, particularly in the United States, which Pepsi was trying to do, that's a really good fit for what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, Then you look at the quality perspective, right? Are these demographics really valuable to Pepsi, right? Pepsi is trying to oftentimes target the fans that are similar to football fans. So yes, another good target area. And essentially from a channel perspective, are you fishing where the fish are? From Pepsi's perspective, sports fans are likely consumers of their product. And they're likely to watch, you know, they're likely to watch uh, a game, particularly an NFL game. So this was a good fit for Pepsi, given what its brand goals were, were trying to be. So both from a quantity and quality perspective, it worked out really well. Um, so this is an example of this is not what Pepsi got specifically because um, we can't show those results. But this is an example of the output that would be developed in our partnership scoreboard platform. Um, so you can see here, or you can sort of see. Um, We have a value calculation, which layers on our valuation algorithm based on those metrics. Uh, We have the number of people who watched a game, a centricity score, a prevalence score, and a time on screen score. Um, So centricity and prevalence are all, they're at a decimal point here, but they're all based on percentages. Uh, 0.541 is around the average, and uh, 0.16 is actually a little above the average uh, in terms of a score. And time on screen for NFL games are actually relatively short uh, because of the way that the NFL does it, but for baseball, basketball, football, those times for each game can be different and larger. You can see here, we can break it out. So we get these results back to our clients within 72 hours. In the past, when it was more human-oriented, it would take weeks or months for people to get the results. And again, weeks or months later, given the the volume of games that happen in the sports industry, I mean, people just literally didn't remember what was going on or what was happening. So being able to get those results into this platform so you can look at it on a day, week, month, season, year-to-date analysis like we have in here or our specific time frames is absolutely critical, in particular for brands that are looking to understand value and understand what's going on. Um, you can see here, I know it's a little bit, uh, uh, might look a little esoteric, but this is what we call a heat map. So a heat map just shows on screen where things appeared more frequently and less frequently. So more fr- frequent is red, less frequent is blue. So you can see in this example, the logo often appeared on the right side of the screen. And you can see from a centricity perspective, parts of it were close to the center, but there were a lot of parts that weren't that close, which is why the centricity score is closer to the, you know, closer to an average level score. Um, the other thing that, again, when I was going back to go back to the Pepsi example, so you can see here, this is a really good, interesting example. So these are all, that uh, board is a dynamic signage board. What that means is that you can change the logo throughout the season, and you saw it again whether it was Lipton or Tostitos in that example, that there was different logos that were there. What Pepsi is not actually the producer of Lipton, it's the bottler of Lipton. So what it wanted to do, instead of having this big, bold logo on the screen, it tested out if they should have the bottle on the screen. And what they figured out is that the, the bottle did not show up on screen as well. It wasn't as close to the center. It wasn't as prevalent. It didn't show up for as long on screen. And they were able to test that within the course of the season. And because they were able to test that within the course of the season, they were able to get accurate feedback and know on a go-forward basis that even though we want to do the bottle, that this big, bold, yellow logo is much more valuable because it's much more likely to be seen and much more likely to maximize value based off the metrics we've discussed. So... What are the benefits of the new approach, especially moving from a uh, human approach to a machine learning neural network-based approach? Um, you can get near real-time results. Uh, like I said, we get our results within 72 hours back to our clients. Um, it's easily sortable. Uh, it's transparent. And um, so what do we mean by that is that you can, uh, our system, in addition to produ- pr- producing these heat maps, we also create these visual thumbnails. So you actually can see every single frame where the logo is in the, in the picture, we actually see exactly where the system says this is a logo. One of the issues that comes up, particularly with machine learning platforms, is that people are worried about relying on a machine. Like, what if a machine misses something? What if a machine screws up? Uh, we've all seen movies where machines have gone berserk. So, like, machines can be, have issues. 
Um, so what we want to do is have a visual, what we call a visual verify tool that allows us to see exactly what the machine is picking up. So that way, if there are any errors, particularly if they're what are called false positives, right? It's supposed to catch the Pepsi logo, but it ends up catching uh, like the Walmart logo. We would end up, okay, we'd see it's caught the wrong thing, and we can automatically um, eliminate that as an error. Um, so that's being able to see all of the different components makes it completely uh, transparent versus a human. A human is not going to take a, a single picture of every single uh, image that is said because they're looking at hundreds, if not thousands, of frames for each game. It's impossible for a human to do that. And again, accessible, rather than getting a report that was generated usually PowerPoint-based or um, Excel-based, you now have a technology platform where you can go in, you can log in, and see everything that's going on. And really, at the end of the day, and this is what I was talking about before with some of our classes, is we need actionable data-driven insights to help make strategic decisions. So what Pepsi used this information for is they built a new platform at AT AT&T Stadium. They wanted to decide if they wanted to renew that platform using that information that we provided them, help them to talk to senior management to say, this is why we got value, this is why this will be valuable in the future, this is why we want to renew this deal, and Pepsi did renew its deal with AT&T Stadium. So you guys have probably, if you watched Cowboys games or home games, you've probably seen the logo on the screen for this season as well. And that's, again, they used our data and information in order to do that. Um, and this is, again, a, a sample of the results. You can see uh, the quote that uh, uh, Pepsi marketing director Justin Toman uh, provided. I'm going to sh- have a short video with him speaking about his actual feedback and results. But again, this is the outcome. This is what we want. We want to get data. We want to get data quickly. We want to be able to understand the data. We want to be able to communicate that data to all partners and all people who are involved in the decision-making process. And we want to make, be able to determine which relationships are adding value and which relationships are not adding value. And we want to do that as quickly and efficiently as possible. Um, so I'll, do, I'll show you a short video, and then we'll have a, a, a couple minutes at the end for questions. We, we started with the Cowboys and a brand new asset that we had in a digital tunnel cover. It was the first digital tunnel cover in the NFL. And really with this new asset came the question of, well, how are we valuing it and, and what value is it providing? Um, so, so as it went in, you know, producing it, going in before the season, giving that some thought and saying, hey, how do we, how do we value um, the, the media that we're getting out of this? So we, we connected with Block 6 um, be, primarily because they had this real-time capability. So it does me no good to know the value after the whole season. I, I need to make um, real-time decisions because this is a digital tunnel cover. I can now tweak the creative or optimize the creative game to game or even inside of a game um, with that ability of, of LED and, and digital um, technology. So really needed to evaluate it real time, game by game basis. So Block Six came with this this ability to say, "Hey, we can tell you a few days afterward what value you got and, and what optimizations uh, from a creative standpoint you might want to think about making." So went ahead with the analysis, and essentially uh, several days after each game, we got this full report card and said, "Here's how the logos performed. Here's what they the, the kind of the heat map that they got. Um, here's the value that that generated from a broadcast standpoint." And we were really then able to make real, essentially real-time decisions on creative. So we were switching logos game to game. We were switching placement of logos. We were switching um, whether we used a bottle image or just a straight logo to try to find that sweet spot of maximizing the value. Um, so huge value in, in that real-time ability to see uh, really what was working and what wasn't in terms of producing media value. Um, and it's a technology and a capability that, that we plan to use more of going forward. You know, example of, of the, the real-time nature. Okay, so that's, again, you saw the results. So, like I said, I'll be around during the course of the day, happy to talk to anybody about the technology, entrepreneurship, or the sports industry more generally, uh, but wanted to open up for questions. Uh, I think we have about five minutes or so for questions. So, go ahead. Uh, so, once a company like Pepsi has the employer representation of how much time their logo was on screen, the clarity, things of that nature, how do they that into like a monetary value and say how much did our sales increase because the logo was visible for a minute 
It's a really, a really good question. Um, so we created, like I said, we create an evaluation algorithm that specifically looks at that. What we try to do is, you were ta- we were talking before about um, you know, double-blind studies or controlling for certain variables. What we do in our, our modeling is we control for certain variables to say, okay, when did the game take place? How much of the revenue should, ha- how much should Pepsi see in a revenue increase? How much did it actually see during this time period? Potentially, depending on the, the client, we have market, uh, you know, geographic level data that says we saw increases in sales uh, by X amount or by Y amount. So what we do is we look at a quarter by quarter revenue analysis of each company uh, that's sponsoring or doing this type of sponsorship. We isolate the variables either by a geography or by specific spend type, and we attribute that value, that dollar valuation, to a specific company. And then we see there's an expected level of performance and an actual level of performance in the model. So our model looks at to say before something happens, what is the expected level of revenue growth, and then what is the actual level of revenue growth? And it could be positive or negative. If there's a positive delta, that means Pepsi has gotten value. If there's a negative delta, that means Pepsi hasn't gotten value. But by looking at and doing detailed financial analysis, which again is something you're learning at this great institution, it sounds like, um, is is something that's really critical part of our model. And that's how we need to determine it. Again, because Pepsi is going to get a different value, even than Coke. You know, Pepsi has a different customer, you know, different customer base, different things that they're looking at. So that's one area from a financial analysis perspective. Pepsi also has specific brand goals. So by looking at the brand goals of what they're trying to do, like we said, in terms of increasing brand awareness, increasing brand perception, making sure that they can get higher levels of engagement across multiple different channels. We're also tracking that information as well. In particular, we have a um, machine learning based platform for social media analysis where we essentially have taught a machine how to read. And by looking at social media conversations, we can see lift in brand awareness, brand, uh, brand awareness, brand perception, and engagement. So we have to look at a lot of different factors, and we have to isolate the factors as much as possible and control for uh, what we think is causing that revenue growth. So it's complicated, and that's something we spend a lot of time building, but it's a very good question. Good. Have you run any models that, uh, I guess, test the, the value of a brand if it's actually on the jersey? Uh, you know, say, for instance, yeah. Yeah, actually, you know, the NFL for their practice jerseys, they actually do have patches. So we've looked at the NFL from a patch perspective, both in terms of the game, you know, practice film and like press conferences itself. Uh, we have done some initial analysis on the jersey patch as well. Uh, later this year, we are probably going to release what's called a jersey patch index. Um, so that we can see across all the different teams what teams are getting in terms of overall value from that exposure. We think it's going to be really high, A, because there's 10 players, B, because there's a lot of close-ups of those jersey patches. And it does like what you're talking about with Premier League jerseys, right? Because the logos are on every player, there's relatively few players, they're really big, usually on the jerseys. And I think that's what we want to see is, right, is there a difference between the Premier League or the small patch? And the NBA is only doing this for three years to get more um, data on what this will look like from a value perspective as well. Because um, the WNBA right now, you can, they do have full, similar to the Premier League. So yeah, we're starting to look at that, um, and we've started to see some really interesting results, but over the next year and over the next couple of years, I think we're going to see some really interesting results. Other question? Go ahead. Yeah, like one more. Oh. oh. Uh, have, you ever explored, have you ever explored using your model for non events? Yeah, so that's a, a, another really good question. Yes. So we've already used it for non-sports. We built this because my experience and expertise was in sports, but nothing of this is sports uh, a requirement to be used in sports. The same technology, the same valuation framework, the same level of analysis can be applied in other areas. We're already looking to expand uh, into the larger media and entertainment space, the conference space, uh, into more uh, what would be more traditional advertising channels. So we're already looking to do that, and we've already applied our technology in those areas as well. Maybe one more. Yeah, so that's also a very good question. So we work, because we have a fully transparent approach, we work with both the buyers and sellers. So the teams themselves are our clients, in addition to companies like Pepsi are our clients, and then there's advertising agencies that typically work with brands that are our clients. So those are our three core client groups. 
So if we're working with the brand itself, like Pepsi, we can oftentimes get much more detailed financial information where we can see, like I was saying before, on the geographic basis, we can get some more detailed financial information. And then what we look at when we provide it to Pepsi is, like again, for the NFL, because it typically happens in the fourth quarter of an annual business cycle, we'll look at Q4 results using the uh, publicly available financial reports, combine that with the information that's being provided for us with the brand um, to get that type of information. And we would provide that directly to Pepsi. And Pepsi can determine if it wants to share it with uh, in this case, with the Cowboys or not. We don't require that, but our system allows for that type of login to happen. On the team side, if we don't have detailed financial information, again, we use publicly available information and our own research from our data partners. That uh, So we work with data partners that provides us with other information as well. We aggregate that together. We provide it to the team. The team has a platform and a portal uh, using our partnership scoreboard to provide logins to their partners. Again, it's not a requirement, but every the idea here is We want to create a new language around sports sponsorship, around value that's specifically customized for specific opportunities, for specific partners, for specific activations. In order for that language to work, everybody has to see the information and everybody has to see how we determine value. If we're able to do that because we have this whole technology ecosystem, we're able to monetize every single piece of the sponsorship transaction because people will be using our language. So that's that's how it all works.